Spotlight is proudly sponsored by HEC Media, St. Louis's home for arts, education, and culture. Now I can have control. That's a real game changer. I just wanted to get these stories written down. I thought somebody might get something out of them. To me, that's the most surprising and wonderful part of what we do. Today on Spotlight, he's the piano player behind a lot of very well-known names. Plus, artwork from local artists that explores the idea of self-reflection. And then a unique approach that helps farmers save time and money by producing crops without soil. But first, one-of-a-kind furniture made from a fourth-generation family farm. It's Sunday and you're watching the multiple Emmy Award-winning Spotlight. We're trying to build good things that people like. And I think the furniture that we build here with integrity is going to be around for a long time. I'm Dave Stein, and we're here at David Stein Furniture in Dow, Illinois. I basically take beautiful hardwoods that we harvest right here in the Midwest and try to make lasting, interesting furniture out of them. We've got a thousand acres, about half of it's timber, and it's been in our family for four generations. My grandfather and, and all of our uncles and my parents always beat into our head, you know, take what you need from the land and leave the rest for the next guy, and there'll always be plenty for everyone. We don't replant trees to just get the trees that we want. What we do is we let the trees that want to grow there grow, and rather than sort of managing or over-managing the forest and trying to grow it like a crop and get just the things we want. Sustainability is a big part of our ethos here. It's really kind of a vertically integrated process that we do here. So basically we steward the forest and we take dead and dying trees and then we mill them up and they go through the kiln process. Now everything comes out of the kiln, it gets marked with a catalog number and sizes and then photographed and put in a database. Then I can show you options from our database of different slabs of wood that might work for your project. And then we try to build furniture that uh, people wanna buy. My inspiration for my designs mostly comes from the natural beauty of the wood and the, and the forest. And so rather than constantly trying to impose my will on wood, it can be what it wants to be. It's not fake. Hopefully it's a classic thing then that lasts forever. I only see things getting better here in St. Louis, honestly. I mean, since I moved back here in 2001, my business has changed quite a bit from selling almost nothing in St. Louis to selling probably 50% of the stuff that we sell here in St. Louis. And I think that rising tide is just gonna continue to lift all boats. I'm a big fan and I just see the trend going up and up. St. Louis has so much to offer and it's just this group of people who are really passionate about the thing that they do and then being able to work with them and be passionate about the stuff we do it's, it's kind of a synergistic thing where we can all kind of feed off each other. I think the really great thing about the group of people I was introduced to in the restaurant community is many of them, almost all of them, are local people who are really trying to do something cool in St. Louis. And they love the fact that they can get restaurant tables and service and everything from me, and I'm here local to the area too. This is a chance to really get involved with the design and structure of maybe your dining room table or your coffee table, something you're gonna sit around every day and be able to enjoy. So I, I think that's really fun. That's, that's been a really fun part of it. I'm just happy people like it. 
this is heirloom quality stuff that we build for you so that you and your family can have it and celebrate around it for years. Scan the QR code on your screen to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. I was always right in the middle of the room. And a lot of times people didn't notice you. So they would say and do anything around you. And I have a memory. <laughs> Musical theater legend Stephen Sondheim once referred to Paul Ford as the world's most tireless rehearsal pianist and a walking memory bank of every song that has ever been written for any musical on any continent. Now in his memoir, Ford recounts his life both on and off Broadway, a personal narrative intertwined with the history of musical theater. He discovered his love of the genre and the piano as a child, a passion encouraged by both his mother and his father. They bought me lots of music. Like for Christmas, it was like, no, I want these 20 vocal scores from Broadway shows. I don't need any underwear, you know, or socks. Don't give me any of that stuff. Just this music, and they would do it. The subtitle of Ford's book, Working with Stephen Sondheim, highlights his experience with the master composer, but candid tales featuring many other luminaries fill its pages. Madonna, Warren Beatty, Lauren Bacall, Patti LuPone, Bob Fosse, and Bernadette Peters, just to name a few. And for 25 years, Ford worked closely with Mandy Patinkin, collaborating on multiple live performances and recordings with the singer and actor. Easy. Anyone can whistle any old day. Easy. It's all well, he, you know, did this movie called The Princess Bride, and he had this line in it, Hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You kill my father, prepare to die. And he would say that at the end of every concert. It was the closest thing I ever got to being involved in a rock concert. And in your book, you don't shy away from, from several, well, many subjects that are uh, oh. controversial in the intro by Mandy Patinkin. He says, uh, if you're afraid of criticism or if you're afraid of Frank speaking opinions, opinions don't, <laughs> or strong opinion, do not pick up, you can stop reading right now, it's over, it's done. Yep. You don't shy away from subjects, people you like, people you didn't like, mm -hmm. performances you liked, performances you couldn't stand, mm -hmm. entire genres of music that you could not, that you did not like and you could not stand. But you're not easy on yourself either. You didn't shy away from your own personal difficulties as far as w with substances and going yeah. in and out of treatment with that. I'll just say it, I've been uh, sober for 27 years and my last um, 20 years of working were um, learning how to really do it and be present. And I used to be very afraid playing the piano. I mean, you know, even though I'm playing great stuff and there's like 20 instruments all around me and singers on stage, I was still afraid. And so I found myself learning how to breathe while performing for Mandy in particular and walking on a stage. And, and uh, I finally was able to really enjoy myself the last 10 years or so. Writing this book, part of you continuing to take care of yourself, kind of giving an accounting of what it was that you actually did back in the day. In a way, but mostly it was 11 years ago, I walked out of rehearsals on a show that I just couldn't do another bad show. So I just left and I told the conductor, I won't be back tomorrow. And then I started, I've got a lot of stories up here and before they go away, I better write them down. And I got some encouragement from a couple of people. So I started writing and writing and writing about 600 pages worth, just anything I could remember and a mess. And then, uh, but was it, was it a purge or was it a gigantic in certain you know, communities? Was it a big fourth step, a personal inventory in a way? But mostly it was I just wanted to get these stories written down because for me, I thought somebody might get something out of them, you know, and just at least a laugh, you know. So I really felt like I've got to preserve all of this, you know, experience I've had and share it. To find out the one song he says inspired his entire career path, watch the full interview at hecmedia.org. They are the best-selling authors and all of your favorite genres. For in-depth, one-on-one interviews, go to hecmedia.org. 
We're at Art St. Louis in downtown St. Louis, Missouri, and this is our personal history juried exhibition. This all media show features works by over 50 artists, and the concept of the exhibit is artworks that focus on one's sense of self. So as artists, we depict ourselves often in self-portraits, but also this can include images from the past, images of our family members, of objects. The images can be of all sorts of things that define who we are. So this is our first show of the new year of 2023, and a new year is all about self-reflection, and personal history as an art exhibition is about self-reflection. So I think that when people come in the door and see the works in this show, that in addition to seeing the depictions of the artists, that viewers will also get a sense of their own selves and see reflections of parts of their lives in these images. Because I think that although the artworks are very specific to each artist who made it, they're also very wide and can be interpreted into our own lives. Art St. Louis is a nearly 40-year-old nonprofit artist organization and gallery, and we work to serve artists in the St. Louis region. So it's a 200-mile radius, and artists from all walks of life, age 18 to 98, as long as they live in the St. Louis region, we are working to support and network and encourage them to be working artists. Whatever artwork that they want to make, we are happy to consider that for our shows. And these are artists who are our neighbors, so that's always really important for us to remind the community that when they walk into the gallery and see these artworks, they're by people who are from our own community. To me, that's the most surprising and wonderful part of what we do. We hope that you'll visit the Art St. Louis Gallery and see personal history in person. The show continues through February 15th, and you can always learn more about our programs at artstlouis.org. The History of St. Louis Cartoons, later on Spotlight. An ag tech company from Utah has a unique approach to providing solutions to a global food crisis. It's an agri-food innovation designed to help farmers and ranchers. It's a autonomous system that produces fresh grass, fresh fodder, fresh barley, wheat, triticale, alfalfa every single day. And what it does is it seeds, it harvests, it produces, all the lights come on, it waters, and every single day you get fresh feed from this system. The system is called Pasture Box. It's a self-contained, fully automated hydroponic system using only water, electricity, and seeds. That means no soil and no fertilizer. Essentially, it's a 45-foot high cube shipping container. So in there, there's lights, in there, there's racks, in there, there's a full automation system. It's hydroponic, so it's using water to grow things. The water feeds the seeds, and in that water, we use ozone, which is a basically a disinfectant of different entities. The shipping container can produce up to 3,000 pounds of premium, fresh, sprouted livestock feed every day. And what it does is it enables producers to have a steady state of feed all year round, and it is not subject to things like weather. We are using sensors. The sensors will say, you have low water. We have sensors that will say the growth is there. We'll have sensors that have weighted trays. All the sensors bring us the data. The Precision Agriculture provides solutions in support of global food security. Renaissance Ag pitched its product, Pasture Box, on stage at the Trilateral Agri-Food Innovation Symposium in St. Louis at the Donald Danforth Plant Science Center. Global innovation leaders from Israel, United Arab Emirates, and St. Louis discuss solutions for food security and climate smart agriculture. BioSDL hosted the event because St. Louis is a hub for plant science innovation. BioSDL invited Renaissance Ag along with other innovative companies for good reason. We've invited a set of innovators, entrepreneurs, startups, putting forth really some brilliant cutting edge ideas that uh, we can use here in Missouri, that we hope that our counterparts in 
United Arab Emirates and in Israel also can use, and that we can bring to others in the world as well. It's believed PastureBox will strengthen global food systems, providing solutions with benefits. This allows farmers to maximize use of their land and reduces costs. If I can ask a producer how much time do they spend feeding their animals every day, it's pretty much all day. They're always doing something in order to get that feed to that animal, whether it's you know moving hay, whether it's moving bedding, uh, that kind of detail. So if I can tell the farmer, you can produce this on site, on farm, and actually reduce your inputs in the field, what can you do with, with that time that you're going to gain? Do you have to buy that next generation tractor that costs X amount of hundreds of thousands of dollars? No, you don't. Do you have to do these kind of stuff? So it actually enables a producer to engage in other challenges uh, in their farm. So maybe they want to increase their herd size, but they can't because they, they have to grow so much food for the current herd size. Well, now maybe you're not cropping so much. Can you increase your herd size? And that's where the interest is there is. Now I can actually change on how I can do this and have control. That's a real game changer in that perspective. HEC celebrates St. Louis like no other media outlet, highlighting those making a difference through science and technology. It's a wonderful community of young entrepreneurs who are all doing very amazing things. Focusing on arts and education. Poverty is not going to stop a student from getting a quality education. We can't let that happen. Broadcasting meetings and functions to educate and inform our community. St. Louis feels like a city on the road to extraordinary things. Producing compelling documentaries celebrating our region. Henry Shaw founded the Missouri Botanical Garden, one of the first of its kind in the country and one of the best of its kind in the world. Visit agcmedia.org for up-to-date, locally produced stories about the people and organizations who make St. Louis great. We're here at the St. Louis Art Museum looking at the exhibition Day and Dream in Modern Germany, 1914 to 1945. The exhibition features prints, drawings, and photographs that were made in Germany in the first half of the 20th century. It features 17 artists, and they really range from the very figurative to the very abstract, really showing the world of art that was made in Germany in the early 20th century. The title of the exhibition was inspired by a portfolio of lithographs made by Max Beckmann in 1946. He lived and taught here in St. Louis from 1947 to 1949, and he was also one of the most successful painters in Germany in the 1920s and 30s. Now, we're very fortunate here in St. Louis that we happen to have one of the largest collections of Beckmann's art in the world. And so, while there are 17 artists in the exhibition, we've included a lot of works by Max Beckmann, including the portfolio Day and Dream. Some other artists I'd really encourage you to look at here in the exhibition one of them is Ketakovitz, who was the first woman admitted to the Prussian Art Academy in 1919 with the founding of the Weimar Republic. She produced some absolutely fantastic and very moving prints that document the plight of the working poor in Berlin in the wartime years. Another artist is Walter Gramate. The museum was fortunate to receive a major gift of works from Walter Gramate's estate in 2019, right before the pandemic. So here in this exhibition, we have these intense psychological portraits that made Gramate famous in his own day, where the psychology of the sitter is written in the lines on the face. And a last artist that I would really encourage you to look at is Olga Zander. He's represented in the exhibition by five photographs, all of which were taken as part of his life's work to document all of German society. I think not everyone knows about World War I, that when it ended, it also brought the end of the German Empire, which had been ruled by the Kaisers. And when Kaiser Wilhelm II abdicated, what replaced him was the first German Democratic Republic. 
Now, after World War I, all of Europe was in shambles, and the democracy that the Weimar Republic offered, including the first constitutional rights, equality of women, invited artists from across Europe to come to Germany, where they finally had the freedom to produce the art that they wanted to. So the exhibition is free, and when you come, do bring your phone with you because we have an online audio guide um, that offers really incredible insights into several of the major works in the show. You can also access it from home too. There's only one month left to see Day and Dream in modern Germany, closing February 26th. To learn more, visit slam.org. Looking for St. Louis-centric videos to use in your classroom? Check out our educational resources at educate.today. It's been a fixture in the paper for over 100 years. You've seen it on the front page every morning. It's the weather bird, the colorful character who is always there to fill us in on the day's events. But who is the man behind the bird? Hi, I'm Dan Martin. I'm the Weatherbird cartoonist for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, and I've been doing drawings and cartoons and designs uh, since 1980 for the Post. I got to the paper in 1980, and Amity Wolschlager was the Weatherbird cartoonist. He had been doing that for 50 years. And then when he retired, Al Schweitzer took the job. Then about 1985, he came to me and said, look, I'm thinking about retiring, would you be interested in this? I said, gosh, yes. And so I've been drawing it since 1986. The Weatherbird has a long history, with many talented artists carrying on its spirit over the years. But the bird itself was born on a train returning to St. Louis on a particularly cold winter day. In 1901, a staff artist for the paper, Harry B. Martin, was coming back from an assignment out west and he was looking through a magazine and it had pictures of little baby birds, little baby blackbirds that he thought were pretty funny. So when he got back to St. Louis, this is in February, and it was snowing and the weather was crummy. And he did some sketches that he thought that would sort of reflect the same entertaining comic features of these photos of these little baby blackbirds. So he realized, you know, it's snowing, this could go with the weather forecast every day. So he drew up about 10 or 12 of these. He submitted them to the editor. And so they ran these. And then the next, when they had to start repeating some, all the readers of the Post wrote in and said, no, we want a brand new weather bird every day. So that's when the madness started. The weather bird quickly became a popular staple in the paper, but cartooning in St. Louis extended far beyond one character. As the city grew in the late 19th century, it became a hotbed for artists. Turn of the century, we're the fourth largest city in the country. There was a lot of artists that were attracted to the Washington University School of Fine Arts that came through here, as well as a lot of artists that went through and were attracted to or worked at the 1904 World's Fair. Some of the most celebrated cartoonists in history have found themselves in St. Louis. Among them were bold political satirists, blunt war correspondents, pop culture caricaturists, and one newspaper magnate who would become one of the most influential media figures of all time. Joseph Pulitzer is a famous publisher. He essentially reinvented journalism and created modern journalism. He was an immigrant from Hungary he was a very educated man, very bright, extremely energetic and ambitious. He was recruited along with other Europeans to come to the United States and fight in the Civil War. When the war was over in 1865, he had no money, no prospects, and he sold his last bit of clothing, a silk handkerchief, to buy a train passage to St. Louis. So when he got to St. Louis, he fell into a crowd of fellow European intellectuals at the St. Louis Mercantile Library. Through those connections, he became involved with the West Liquor Post, a German language newspaper in St. Louis, who was very famous. And then he became an owner of, of the West Liquor Post, and later he was able to buy the St. Louis Dispatch and St. Louis Post and combine them in 1878. He was here until he went to New York and bought the New York World. Pulitzer died in 1911. And then he left about $2 million of his estate 
to Columbia University in New York City to establish a journalism school and prizes. And so today, that's still the most prestigious award and world famous, the Pulitzer Prizes. And it really started by an ambitious young Hungarian here in St. Louis. Joseph Kepler was a, actually an Austrian immigrant and uh, got to the Post Dispatch after the Civil War. He met Joseph Pulitzer at the same German bookstore that both of them like to go to. And he started a publication called Puck, and it didn't go over very well here. It, it kind of flopped. But then he went on to New York City and revived it again, and it became a huge sensation. It was sort of the defining American humor magazine that all other humor magazines have derived from. And it was noted because it had these a tremendous stable of artists, uh, world famous cartoonists. Al Hirschfeld was arguably the greatest caricaturist of the 20th century. He was born and raised here in St. Louis. He was a, really a child protege and really gifted. And so when he was about 10 or 11, uh, his mother took him to an art instructor and said, what, you know, what more can we teach this child? And the instructor said, you really need to go to New York. So that's when they moved to New York, and then uh, he worked uh, doing drawings in the motion picture industry there. But he became famous for drawing uh, theatrical caricatures. So he haunted the theaters of Broadway and did sketches in the dark. These were famous in New York Times. Anyone that has an Al Hirschfeld drawn of them covets it. Bill Walden, he won the Pulitzer Prize here in St. Louis for cartooning in 1959 for a story about Russian gulags and uh, Boris Pasternak, the author. But his even greater fame came when he was a much younger man in 1945. He worked for the Stars and Stripes during World War II, and he created these two characters called Willie and Joe that were the quintessential dog face average guy soldiers. Anyone that was a GI that's still around from World War II. They revere Willie and Joe and Bill Maul. Throughout all the change and tumult of the 20th century, the Weatherbird has remained a constant. Now, as it continues into its second century, we look back on its legacy and its path into the future. I try to bring the Weatherbird up to a more almost national relevance. I feel a great personal responsibility to carry this on as long as I can, and that the paper carries it on as long as they can, because it's a terrific tradition. It's the oldest continually run daily cartoon in the country, and uh, we're pretty proud of it at the Post. Next week, Webster's annual exhibit showcasing artists in the area, plus a book explaining Bosnian communities in St. Louis. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.